Hi, Nancy Spears with GenConnectU, and today I have the privilege of speaking once again to one of our most favorite experts, Dr. Gail Gross, about her new book and some other things we're going to be talking about. But this new book is so hot, How to Build Your Baby's Brain. It recently just won two awards, the Parenting.com Product Award and the Book Authority Best New Parenting eBook for 2019. That is remarkable. Hi, <laughs> hi, Dr. Gross, how are you? Good morning, Nancy, great. Nice to see you again. You as well, congratulations on, on this tremendous success and the world was really ready for this book. I, I'm so excited about it because for me it was a service and I realize that you know, it's, so much is going on in the world and so many parents are confused and getting bombarded with all kinds of information and I sat down to do this really as a service. So I hope that a lot of people have access to it because I think it will be something that can help parents gain a sense of security going forward with their families. So what inspired you to write the book? What inspired me to write the book was that I was a working parent. And so I really understand the emotional conflicts of having to leave your children and go to work and all the problems that happen with illness and having your employer be unhappy if you have to take time off. Because I experienced those things, I could meet parents at the edge. And the things that I did to help myself and my children navigate that territory, I, I felt would help other parents. And that really was my inspiration. That plus this real problem in our culture today with in, bom, parents being bombarded with so much information and not really knowing which way to turn. Everyone thinking they have to be an expert when actually the only thing they have to do is bond really well with their children. Yeah, I think that was one of the um, most impressionable aspects of the book where you really talk about the super important um, quality of, of parental bonding and um, how you can inoculate your child against the fear of failure through that bonding. Can, yes. can you talk a little bit about yes, that? Yes, because a well-bonded child is better at everything. They're secure. And if you're secure, you problem solve better, you stick to your problems better, you don't break down for group pressure, pure group pressure. You're able to really trust yourself because you've built a strong inner core. And children really are born with a certain amount of uh, genes, but they won't all express. And it's parents that have the difference, that make the difference by the way they support their child's environment. And that decides which genes express and which stay silent. So it's like being in front of a mixing board. And you're the parent, you're a true gene therapist. And you turn on some genes and you turn off some genes by the experiences you offer your child. What we now know from neuroscience is DNA is not the story. It's part of the story, but not the whole story. It really is a 50-50 split. Nurture nature, that same argument we've had from time eternal. You can be born with a certain amount of genes and the potential for certain things, but it's the experiences you have that actually decide which genes come forward and which are enhanced and that has everything to do with mom and dad. You know, and this sounds so s simplistic, but if I said to you, Nancy, if you talk to your children in more complex language, rather than using short commands or talking baby talk, that every time you speak in a more complicated sentence, your baby is building a bigger associative mass in his or her brain, and if I told you by doing that one simple thing, you had the potential to raise your child's IQ by 20 points, you would do it, wouldn't you? Absolutely. You can. And that, that kind of simplistic thing can make a tremendous difference. If I said that leaving your child and not compensating for time away from zero to three makes your child anxious, and when your child is anxious, they overproduce some of the stress hormones, in particular cortisol. Cortisol, if it's consistently overproduced, bathes the brain, and it changes, ultimately, brain architecture in a developing brain, as well as impulse control. So 
If you're going to be away, i.e. working, you have to compensate for time away so that baby feels secure. Every gurgle, every coo when you're bathing your baby, every hug, every song you sing, every book you read is snap, crackling, and popping in your child's brain, making all these synapses which are determining who your child is going to be. The synapses that you're creating, those connections that you're creating, are the ones that are being used. They're tracking. So the neurons that aren't being used through these bonding modes are really being cast out. We call this synaptic pruning, so that the brain becomes more efficient. And then what is being used, hugging, loving, massaging, talking, cooing, singing, using complicated language, those are becoming strong. And so we are really creating the synaptic mapping in our child's brain by the experiences we have with our children. And so every bonding experience makes them secure. And by being secure, they can confront anything Fantastic. So I know in the book you, you, you go into um, in great detail the importance of reading to your child. Oh, reading is so important. You know, <clears throat> we think of a baby as a little seedling in utero. We think, oh, there's this, we call it a fetus, so we don't relate to it as a human being. So there's a fetus, a seedling in our womb <laughs> that's growing and we're fertilizing it with our, our food and what we eat and so forth. But actually, from four months on, that little person is learning our language, is feeling anger, is feeling happiness. If there's twins in their womb, I know you had twins, they sidle up to one another by pushing their sacks towards each other. They put their cheeks against each other through the sacks. They fight. They love, and they're learning your language. We, you know, Noam Chomsky was sort of the guy who talked about language. Now, Patricia Cole from Seattle tells us and has proven to us that our babies from four months in utero on are learning our native language by listening to our voice through the womb, so through an echo chamber. So they're hearing our voice, so they're hearing our meter, our rhythm, and the tone of our voice, and that is our particular language. Now, if at a certain hour each day, father and mother read the exact same book to our baby in utero, day after day or night after night until baby is born, when baby is born and is fussy, if dad reads that same book, that he has read to baby through mom's tummy, baby will quiet. She'll recognize dad's voice that she's heard through the mom's tummy. She'll definitely recognize mom's voice and it will comfort her or him and it, it will be soothing. So what do we know about mom's voice in particular? We know that the minute that baby is in, from four months on in utero, if baby hears mom's voice, her sucking increases, or his sucking increases. And we can test that in utero. After birth, immediately after birth, like 24 hours later, we can put some electrodes on baby's scalp and have 20 languages spoken, and baby won't relate. But if baby hears English, if that's mother's native language, the brain will start lighting up. But if baby hears mother's voice, speaking mother's native language, the whole brain lights up like an orchestra. Therefore, if baby has hearing problems that are genetic, that are starting in utero, or have been caused by some problem through development, those rhythms and meters and tones have been heard incorrectly. So it's so important to know your baby and pay attention so that you can identify hearing problems right off the bat or or learning problems right off the bat, because early remediation makes all the difference. You know, we've all heard children who had hearing problems at, at birth, and they weren't remediated quickly enough, and they speak English as if they're a foreigner. So if we immediately notice, we have to know our children, we have to be around our children, 
then we can remediate with speech therapy. The most important thing is to know your child. It's absolutely fascinating. So what advice can you give um, mothers with new children, new babies, on, um, on reading, what to read, examples of? If you can read one book over and over again, it really is soothing to your child. Another thing that I did when my children were little and I was a working mother is I would record my voice and tell stories to them over a recorder. And I would play that when they were in a, a crib. And I would play that when they, before they went to sleep. And I would tell stories and then I would say their prayers. And in the stories, I would use their names. I would replace the characters in the story with their names. And that way, I would speak to them directly so that they came to expect that, yes, I would have to go to night school, but I was going to come back because, you know, children have no time or space understanding. And also, when you're gone, they feel abandoned. Their cortisol overproduces. We can measure it from the saliva hour by hour as you're gone exponentially. So if we uh, make our children create a habit in a way to expect that, yes, we have to go. We don't want to go. It makes us sad to go. But we have to go, and we will return. And they can know that we're going to return. And we set up a pattern that they adjust to. Then they don't overproduce cortisol. Think of it this way. If you had a child in an infant seat in the back seat, say they were two months old, and you drove to a 7-Eleven for a cup of coffee, and you locked your car, and you were only gonna be gone two minutes to run in and get your coffee and run out. And in that two minutes, some stranger broke your window, grabbed your baby, and started running. And you come out of the 7-Eleven or whatever the store is, and you see your baby running, uh, being, being taken away by someone running away. That sheer panic, that sheer fear, that adrenaline pumping, that cortisol pumping is what your baby feels the minute you separate from them for long periods of time. So mothers don't get that much time off. Many times they go back in six weeks or two months. What do they have to do? Put their baby in a nursery with strangers. And no matter how wonderful the nursery is, and we can find some really great nurseries, they're dealing with lots of children and they want to keep them well and dry and fed and quiet. So it's so important that we pick the right nursery, that we pick the nursery that has our philosophy of teaching and, and, and so forth. And we have to make sure that our babies aren't being abused or hurt, so we have to make unexpected visits to those nurseries. And we have to accommodate for that time away, compensate, and the best of all possible worlds, as Voltaire said in Candide, would be if our workplace had adjacent to it a nursery for their employees so that their employees could take a 10 o'clock break and spend a few minutes with their baby, take their lunch time and not have it with their friends, but have their lunch time with their baby, take a 3 o'clock break come in and have it with their baby, and then pick up their baby at the end of the day. Now you're creating a pattern that baby gets used to, and he's not therefore overproducing cortisol, because he learns to expect you haven't abandoned him, and you are coming back at these designated times. It's also great to, if your baby's being left home with a nanny or a babysitter to put your picture around so that they know that that you're there with them even though you're not. These recordings, which work very well, they soothe children and comfort children. So you do everything to compensate for time away. Because actually, our culture separates too quickly from our children. Think of it this way. A baby is your roommate for nine months. And then suddenly, they're born. And we put them in a separate room. Imagine how they feel. And then we let them cry it out because we have this idea that we will let them cry until they get tired of crying and then ultimately they'll stop and we have then taught them to stay in their room without us. But that's not really what's happening psychologically. What's happening in the brain is that your baby is giving up. 
So when they finally stop crying after two nights or two weeks or whatever we do to try to teach them to stay in their bed at night, now they're, they're changing their brain architecture. So much so that these are the children that are often less motivated. They give up too quickly. When you consider that the brain is creating a, a trillion connections in one year, that your baby is using more energy from one to 10 than you will use in your life from 10 to 100. So imagine what's going on in that brain. And that brain is developing and it's creating neural connections and the experiences that baby is having are determining what's connecting and what's not, what message is getting through and what's not, and how they're, they're going to develop. I like to say, it's actually my husband's line, so I have to give him credit, but I like to use it, which is, who you are to be, you are becoming. And who our children are to be, they are becoming. And who is really determining that? Either we will, by the experiences we create for our children, the compensation we give our children. Our children don't ask to be born, but if we bring them into the world and we have to work or we choose to work, that's all fine, but we have to compensate. And that means we have to be grown up, very grown up. We have to override our impulses to be tired, to come home and kick off our shoes and turn on the TV or have a glass of wine. No, if we have children, we have to be with our children till bedtime and, and talk to them and interact with them. And on the weekends, even though we really want to hang out with our friends because we've worked all week, we need family time, real family time. There are things built into our culture that conspire really to take children and separate us from our children. It's very strange when biologically, nature conspires to attach us to our children. For example, when a baby is born, they can see approximately 13 inches. So if you're breastfeeding, baby can be in your arm at your breast, and that's 13 inches from your eye. And they look so cute and cuddly. We reach for them if they, they react, if we do something. They want our attention. They focus on our face. And not only do they want our attention, but what we do to react makes them react. If we smile, they smile. If we laugh, they laugh. Because they're looking for our input. Because we're everything. Our babies do not see us as something separate. They see us as an appendage. And as a result, when we have siblings too close, two years instead of three years, there's jealousy because there's possession. That's my mother. I can't even imagine that some other baby's on my mother's lap because that's my mother, because you're an appendage to your child. So we have to be thoughtful and skillful. That doesn't mean we don't make private time for ourselves. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't make connecting time for our mate. And that doesn't mean we should make some time for our friends. But I had a friend tell me once, and I always laugh about this, that she would put her children to sleep first, which I did, before I would go out at night. And her children were so sensitive to noise, she would get dressed to go out at night, and then she would put a robe over her clothing, and she'd put her babies to sleep, or her child to sleep, and then she would sneak out of the room, and then she would sit down on the stair, not walk down the stairs, <laughs> and she would literally sit stair by stair by stair till she got to the bottom, so she wouldn't wake up her children. But, actually, when I would put my children to sleep and then go out, I would say to them that, that when I came back, I would wake them up and let them know I came back, whether they woke up or not. And that's what I would do. What you say you have to do. Trust is based on experience. Children learn to count on you to be reliable. So if they can trust you, they can trust themselves. If they trust themselves, they can trust the outer world. So at the end of the day, every interaction with our children is making a difference. We can see, for example, if we know our children, if we have a shy child. If we have a shy child, we now can see it 
in the brain, just like we can look in the womb now and see all this activity. I call it a womb with a view because technology has allowed us to have MRIs and it's allowed us to have ultrasounds and it's allowed us to look into the brain and see what's lighting up and what's not, what's being affected and what's not. So if a child is shy, we can see it in the brain. And if we know our child is shy, which if we're a savvy parent and we're with our children, we can identify. It's the child that nestles in the nape of your neck when somebody new comes in the room or gets fussy when strangers are around or reaches to you and doesn't want anybody to take them or starts some satisfying uh, self-soothing like sucking a thumb, or curling their hair or wetting their bed when they're around strangers. And also, our children don't like other children. So when we identify what our children are doing, when we recognize and acknowledge their self-soothing or they're under stress, because children who even are around other children in a nursery situation are under stress. They don't really like to be with other children. In fact, a, t- a two-year-old will turn her back or his back on other children in parallel play. But their anxiety goes up, their cortisol goes up when they're around other children. Because until about three, they don't really want to hang out with others. They just want to be with mom and dad. And so if we recognize these things with our children, we can intervene. How? By helping them through trust. What we've taught our children is they can count on us right away. So now we say to our children, Somebody is going to come over to visit for five minutes. And then you say to your children, when they come in, we're just going to visit with them and they're going to leave immediately in five minutes. And when five minutes is over, even though your child can't determine five minutes, you ask that person, you made a pre-arrangement with your friend and five minutes, they get up and leave. And each day you build on that so that your baby learns that if you say something, you mean it, that they can count on you, and that in five minutes, you're not gonna manipulate for six minutes or seven. Ultimately, they get big enough where they can recognize on a clock and you show them, when the hand goes there, so-and-so is going to leave, and that's five minutes. And little by little, at three years old, we can look at the brain of that child again, and guess what? No shyness lighting up. If you do this every day and you're building competence and confidence in your child and you're doing this through trust because your child has come to learn that he or she can trust you and that neighbor is going to stay five minutes and leave, by three years old you built a new track in the brain and now those neurons neurons gather around that track and guess what? If you take an MRI of that baby's brain they're not lighting up, they're not shy anymore. Will they ever be Jacqueline Kennedy? No. Will they be socially competent and confident and functional? Yes. Would they have been with no intervention? No. So genes are not the whole story. DNA is not the whole story. That's half the story. We, parents, are the true gene therapists. We can make the difference. And it's so important. Our culture has made us detach too early. And when we look at other cultures, we get a signal of what is more natural to our children. For example, in China, a mother might be working in whatever capacity, but she has her child with her many times. If she's in the field, in the rice paddy, she may have her child on her back. And In Africa, mothers carry their children in a sling that we all are copying now in our culture. What does that do? That puts baby right on her heart, that heartbeat that baby is used to because she's been her roommate for nine months or his roommate for nine months. Now, what is mother doing? As she goes along in her day, she's socializing her baby and culturizing her baby. And what do we know about these babies? They're calmer. They're not anxious, they're happier, they're better adjusted. Why? Because they're with mom. They're with mom and they're moving with mom all through mom's day. 
So they're hearing conversations. They're building that associative mass. They're, they're feeling comforted. They're experiencing a community, a community of people that are friendly and, and like-minded. So in the West, we be become too clinical, too sanitized, too separate from our children, too institutionalized, and our children are suffering for that. That is a critical point that you touch on is the stress because of the, and the anxiety because of um, the speediness of our culture and the demands of our culture. Um, but you also emphasize the importance of meditation and uh, breeding empathy and compassion in your child. So can you yes. give us some ideas on that? Yes. Thank you. That's a great question, Nancy. So in, in our culture, if I said to you, one of our greatest problems, I don't care what the illness is, I don't care what the physical illness is, the emotional illness is, the relationship problems are, we are talking about one word, stress. Stress is the, the real problem of our culture. And we've stressed ourselves, first of all. So we've stressed ourselves in our workplace, in our social place, in our social networking place. We're not supposed to have a thousand friends. We're really meant to live in small communities. So when we branch out and have a thousand friends on social media or whatever, and we really interact with all of these people, it elevates our stress hormones. And it makes us feel envious, it makes us feel jealous, it makes us feel stressful when we see how everybody on social media are living these big lives, but are they really? You know, they're, they're busy taking pictures, but not being, not invent, really experiencing really the, the moment and being in the moment. They're busy photographing the moment. So we're building stress, and then what do we do with our children? We build the same stress in our children. So the stress that we experience with ulcers and headaches and, and some adults still wet their beds and biting our nails and pulling our hair and, and having drugs and alcohol to self-medicate and reduce stress. Now what happens with our children? They're getting our same stress problems. We see children wetting the bed way too late. We're seeing children have ulcers way too early. We're seeing children that can't interact with others, pulling out their hair, showing us their discontent in so many ways, not being able to sleep at night, having nightmares, and a lot of regressive behavior, biting nails. So headaches and stomach aches. So we know that we're stressing ourselves by our environment, the friends we keep, and we're stressing our children by the environment and the stress and the friends we've, we're having our children keep. And so at the end of the day, we have to bring it on home. We have to come back and figure out ways to reduce stress, not push our children and dress up way before their time in seductive outfits that make them uncomfortable, but they want to fit in and be like their friends. And so at six years old, we have them in, in outfits that are way too provocative. The toys that we buy are way too provocative. And, and all of these things make our children uncomfortable because they know that this is way too provocative. They just don't understand why they feel uncomfortable, why they feel guilty and, and, and stressed. And I always loved this book written by Dr. David Elkind. He wrote The Hurried Child and The Miseducation of the American Child. And he speaks a lot of pressing our children into adult behavior and stressing them to perform on levels. He, he quotes a, a story about a child, and I think I quote it in my book. She's in kindergarten, and she's all stressed out. She's afraid she's going to fail kindergarten because her parents are putting so much pressure on her to perform. Think about it. I, my, I myself was on a bus with my husband, and we were with a group in Washington, and my daughter-in-law called and she said, Mom, so-and-so got into um, this particular school, that my grandchild got into this particular school. And my husband and I went, oh, great. And everybody on the bus said, what college did she get into? I said, oh, no, nursery school. You see? 
These children have to be signed up at birth. And, and our children refused to do that. My son and daughter-in-law said, no, we're not signing our children up at birth. And, and they wouldn't do that. But so many of these children are signed up at birth to get into the, the exact right nursery school. I'd love to talk about this obsession with parents actually defining their child's path and before the child has any input right. and what kind of d damage that actually does. Well, you see that in sports a lot, for example, because, because the way we now know the brain works in neuroscience, we know that the brain tracks something that's habitual, done over and over and over again. So that means that the neurons cluster around that behavior. For example, language. A baby can learn five languages if each person that they come in contact with regularly speaks one particular language to them. So I had a friend who lived in Egypt. She became a, a translator at the UN without taking language courses. But her grandmother spoke to her in Arabic. Her mother spoke to her in Greek. Her father spoke to her in French. And her, other, her nanny spoke to her in another language. And little by little, she had five languages just growing up because we make these tracks. Now, if she'd learned those languages, not zero to 10, but at 10, she would have had a foreign accent. But learning them zero to 10, the tracks hold as initial. And so the, there are enough neurons, therefore, to cluster around each track. So now what happens with sports, for example? Say your father notices that you're very athletic and you can be a, a good baseball player. And so when you're just little, he starts playing baseball with you. Well, what's happening? We now know you're making those tracks and all those neurons are gathering around those tracks. Now say as an adult, you don't really want to play. You're good, but you might want to play basketball. You can learn basketball because you're a good athlete, but will you ever be as good at basketball as you were at, at, um, at baseball? No, you won't because the early track was baseball. So your child is put into a framework that he may not really want to follow through, but he'll be good at it. And boy, if he has a natural talent for it, he'll really be great. And the same thing is with anything else that we expose children to. So I suggest that we create an environment that has a multiple of things that children can gravitate to. If we make that environment safe and secure, and that environment has things that children can manipulate and play with and, and touch and feel and experience and crawl and move around with, then they're learning about their environment and they're learning about things that interest them and we're building that associative mass. And then ultimately, as they start entering middle school, a kindergarten or even earlier in uh, nursery school, they can, they can play with symbols and things that make noise in your own house. Pots and pans are great. And little by little, we can move them into a myriad of instruments that they might want to play, but we don't make them do anything. I tell parents, don't, don't buy any instrument and make your child take violin lessons or tuba lessons or trumpet lessons. Rent the instrument and rent it short term so they can try these things out see if they like them. If they like them, they'll go on. If they don't like them, they'll move on. And if, if we do it this way, we can help our children find their gifts, their natural talents. And then we should allow them the time to explore those things and express those things. And that's the way we f help our children find their way in the world. Through that exploration, that's fantastic. In chapter two of the book, you talk about turning your child's shortcomings into strengths. That's right. Because well, shyness is a perfect example. But, you know, for example, I was young in school. My mother put me in kindergarten when I was only four years old. Then I skipped a grade. So I was in second grade, and I was probably only six. I may have been even a little younger. So I was a chatty Cathy. And everyone in my family talked, talked, talked about everything. My father came home at night, and we all just talked. 
We were happy to see him. He had put in a, a long day, and we were happy to talk. So I just thought that was appropriate. And here we are in second grade, and I can still see Miss Cassie. That was my teacher's name. And I recognized that I understood what she was writing on the board pretty quickly. So that freed me up to talk. So when I recognized and understood what she wrote on the board, I talked to the child next to me, talked to the child on the other side, and pretty soon Miss Cassie lifted me out of my seat, put me into a corner, and put a dunce cap on my head. Well, there I was with a dunce cap. I didn't even understand what was going on. And she put my back to the children and my face to the corner. So I kept turning around because I wanted to be with the other children and I didn't quite get what was it that I did that was so terrible. So fast forward, what do I do now? I talk for a living. So that was my shortcoming and it really became my career. Many children with ADD, you know, one of, one of my producers for PBS had ADD and I interviewed her in fact and she was a six-time Emmy Award winner. With ADD, she was able to deal with a lot of stimulation. She could work with a lot of static because that was what her problem was, and she, that was how she was organized. But she found a job that let her multitask, let her work with all her static, and she became a producer. So if you find what your children's issues are, you can help them. And, and really, it's the environment you create for them to help those things become strengths for them, not weaknesses. And we can, if we are with our children early enough, we can help remediate. We, have, if we can notice not just a shy child, but an aggressive child. And I, I write in this either surgeon or a serial killer, but in rea reality, you know, I couldn't be a surgeon because I couldn't cut somebody's skin. I couldn't do that. My brother was a surgeon, and, and he could do that. But you have to be a, a certain kind of personality to go into certain careers. And we can identify our children if we're with our children. So if I have a very aggressive child that could become a serial killer, or a, 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 a child that is abusive, or an abuser, if I recognize that early on, which there are these roadmaps that help me recognize that, I can do things to help my child early on track in a different direction. Because the brain tracks by the experiences we create for the brain. And the neurons will gather around those tracks that we are creating by the experiences we create in the brain. So you know, Dr. Gross, much of our audience are working mothers, and they also want to have children or do have children. What advice can you give in terms of when are those real critical years, and how can they, how can they balance? Yes, you know, I was a working mother. I really understand. I can meet mothers on that edge because I understand all the conflicting messages we have to deal with and all the problems, and therefore I have a, a chapter in the book where I deal with compensation and, and guilt and what we can do. Tr guilt, I say, in search of a transgression. Because we're all doing the best we can with what we have to work with. But the most important years for the brain development, the developing brain, really are zero to five. And we know this because we know that, as I said, in the first year of life only, you're making a trillion connections in the brain. So imagine year by year up to the age of 10, what's going on in the brain, how rapidly the energy is being used, how rapidly the connections are being made. So what happens 0 to 10 is amazing, but what happens 0 to 5 is basically setting the stage for who you will be for the rest of your life, how you'll deal with stress, how you'll deal with anger, how you'll deal with shyness. So almost everything in those are, is really being set up from 0 to 5. So, you know, as we said earlier, Florence Goodenow said, just complicated language can build a child's IQ by 20 points, zero to five. And Benjamin Bloom tells us that half of your child's IQ is done by the time they're four years old. And, and by the time they're in the eighth grade, they're really 80% done. 
But interestingly enough, the brain isn't done developing or growing. You're not out of adolescence until 24. So what's so amazing about that <clears throat> is that as mothers, we are so worried about our teenagers, and we should be, because their brains aren't finished. And what part isn't finished? The impulse control, the piece about danger, the piece about feeling omnipotent, that they feel that they can handle it, whatever it is, and really they can't, because their brain isn't done, and so they're not really thinking in a, in a critical way. And what sets us apart from all other primates is our large prefrontal cortex and our executive function and the way we think. So this is not finished. If we were born finished, we couldn't be born through the birth canal. Our heads would be too large. So we have to be born, I say, uncooked. We're not finished. And we have to realize that how helpless our babies really are. A monkey is far as a much more advanced primate in the beginning, far more advanced than we are in the beginning. We're completely helpless. We can't see very well. We can't hear very well. We can't help ourselves. We can't eat by ourselves. We, we just lie there. And we depend on, on our environment to care for us, on our mother and our father. And if they show us that they meet our needs when our needs are ne needed, when we're hungry, when we're wet, when we're tired, then the brain is developing in a successful way because it knows its needs are going to be met. So it's not anxious, it's not frightened. But if our needs aren't met, if we're too frustrated, then what happens? Then our brains start being afraid and we overproduce cortisol and it impacts the brain architecture. Now, it is important to frustrate baby a little bit so that they know that we're going to meet their needs because it's better for us to frustrate baby than have environment haphazardly frustrate baby. But we need to be reliable and especially in those first five years to be counted on to be there for our children, to meet their needs to comfort them when they need comforting. That means to not abandon them, to not just stick them in a room and close the door. And even for child discipline, you know, it became very popular to have time out. Time out is fine, but we can't have time out in isolation. We can't have baby time out in their room. We have to have baby time out where we are, that we're there, that we're not letting them go. We're separating them from activity, but we're there. You know, even when our little scientist or our little explorer reaches out in the early uh, period of development, crawling and, and so forth, they still look back to see if they can see us, to see if they can hear us. And they're looking back so that they'll now feel secure enough to go forward. And where they end their travels in that first day, they begin the next day. And so we're building their associative mass, we're building their confidence, and therefore we're building their competence. And they're building on this day by day by day. And so we have to compensate for time away. And we have to really interact with our children, bond with our children. And if we can't be there in the day, we have to be there in the evening and we have to be there on the weekends so that they know that they can be secure, that they can count on us to be there. Dr. Gross, your book goes into great detail in each stage of development of a child and their brain and gives so much great advice for parents and mothers in particular. Um, can you summarize and give us more of a big picture kind of bird's eye view? Your questions are are brilliant, Nancy, because the whole book really is about telling parents, mothers and fathers, what to expect when in development and what to do about it to have your child reach his or her full potential. So what do we know about the brain? We know that the brain develops in a certain way and there are their optimal windows of opportunity when if we teach certain things at certain times, at the right times in fact, the brain will have its 
best opportunity to fulfill its potential. So my book lays out what to expect when. What are those windows of opportunity and how can we address them? What, knowing those stages of development, how we can affect those stages of development so your child reaches his full and absolute uh, possible potential. And then further on in the book, I give you three parallel courses. I show you what Piaget tells us about how the brain develops. I tell you what Erickson tells us about the way the brain develops emotionally and uh, Piaget cognitively. And I tell you what Kohlberg tells us about the way the brain develops uh, in relation to character and character development. And now I put you on a parallel course so that you know what the windows of development are, what the stages of development are, what the optimal windows are for development, the optimal window for language, the optimal window for reading, the optimal window for math, the, what to expect when, when baby's going to grasp something, when baby's ready to use a fork or a spoon, or when baby's ready to walk, when baby crawls, each stage of development, what to expect when, and then how to address it, how to affect it. But also, along with that, I tell you, because you have this, uh, with latitude, this developmental chart, you also know what to look for if it's not happening correctly. If baby isn't developing on time and in the correct way with, with latitude, then we know how to remediate, where to go, and who to, who to, to go to for help. Because if we catch these problems early, we can ch because the brain is so plastic, we can address them and remediate them in, m in many cases. So this book gives you the windows of opportunity, it teaches you the stages of development, and tells you, therefore, how you can affect those stages for optimal development. And then it also gives you a parallel course of Piaget, which is cognitive development, Erickson, which is emotional development, and Kohlberg, which looks at character and how to bring them into the mix as we're deliberately affecting our child's development and truly becoming our child's true gene therapist. The, the book is, is, is it's a must read for any parent or uh, couples who are considering having children. My children are now 21. And as I told you earlier, Dr. Gross, I wish I'd had this book when they were babies. Um, but you know, um, it's such a gift um, to parents around the world and congratulations on, on, on a masterpiece really. It's, it's a fantastic book. Thank you, Nancy. I do wanna say so that parents aren't overwhelmed because we do have to work. We, we're really a two-parent working society. So, but I do want parents to not feel guilty to know they can compensate for time away. And I want them to know they don't have to have EDDs or PhDs or be teachers or early child development specialists. All they have to do is bond with their children. Bonding is the key to success. Bonding is the key to a happy child. And learning ways to, to help your child reduce stress so that they can self-manage their own stress or test anxiety or whatever or whatever. And that includes meditation. That includes self-knowledge. That includes breathing exercises mm -hmm. and yoga exercises. And I offer all of that in this book and show you what addresses what stressor and how to do qigong for children, yoga for children. And I list the, the way of doing these things. And I did this with my own children. I taught my own children to meditate when they were very little. But I do want to say one thing that I forgot earlier that is central to brain development, and that is Baroque music. Not Mozart, not Tchaikovsky, not Baroque music. Baroque music is particularly syncopated to your heartbeat, 60 beats per minute in the Andante measure. 
And what we know about Baroque music is because we can see the brain through an MRI, we can see the brain through a CAT scan, we can see what's going on in the brain, we can see that when we play Baroque music, the brain goes into a meditative state. Therefore, it uses the brain like an orchestra. It throws more blood to the prefrontal cortex, therefore you can hold images longer, you can focus and concentrate better, and actually the way I learned to meditate was not for spiritual reasons, but it was to help my children. I was a school teacher at the time, and I wanted to help my children be better students, and I wanted to help them learn techniques that would help them concentrate and focus better. So meditation, breathing techniques, yoga, qigong, we, these are all ways we can teach our children how to manage, self-manage their own stress. And this is so important for our children. It's a, truly that and bonding are the greatest tools. So you know, Dr. Gross, when um, I was pregnant with the twins, I would play music on Fabulous. my belly. Fabulous. And then once we had the children, um, we actually introduced meditation early in. Yes. Um, this woman wrote a book called Peaceful Piggy Meditation, and we yes. practiced that. Can you expand upon um, the importance and significance of music um, and meditation on the brain? When my grandchildren were born, I had my children tape Baroque music. A good example of Baroque music is Pachelbella Canon in D. Everybody gets married to it, but they don't know why. It's because it makes them feel so rest, relaxed and happy. But Baroque music, uh, they, I had them put Baroque music in an iPod and play it around the clock in their nursery for their children. And what does that do? It keeps the mind, the brain, in a relaxed state so that everything comes to the brain and is used by the brain in, in a better way because the brain is used better when it's relaxed. It's really used like an orchestra. There have been studies where we put electrodes on, on the um, players in an orchestra and how their brains all become syncopated and light up together as they play their uh, concert. So the brain and, and Baroque music are really wonderful together. And it has, Baroque music has a similar effect on the brain as meditation. You know, music is really, uh, in some cultures, believed to be the way God created us to be really responsive to rhythm, tone, vibration, music. Even our voices are lyrical. It's all music. And so we're organized biologically to respond to music. And we know that our, our moods change in relation to music. And so we can see that circulation changes in response to music. Uh, as I said, we can throw more, we throw more blood to the prefrontal cortex when we're relaxed in response to Baroque music in particular. So we learn better with music. So when I created um, learning tapes, I used Pachelbella Canon as the background music. So people thought they were learning meditation or learning whatever, but actually the partner to the meditation was the Baroque music. And when I taught um, children in my one-year pilot study in the HISD system how to meditate and have stress reduction and so forth, I used Baroque music in those tapes. Because Baroque music is the greatest ally to meditation and learning. Because in a sense, it puts the body in the same space and the brain in the same space as meditation. So it re relaxes not just the mind, but it relaxes the body. And in my book, How to Build Your Baby's Brain, I offer progressive relaxation and meditation, and I talk about Baroque music quite a bit.